You're listening to the Anthony Ford Broadcast. I do have a, a special, special guest that gives me a really a great pleasure to introduce. Many of you have asked me, how do you get into uh, voiceovers or what does it take to get into voiceovers? And what I can tell you is that the person that was my original and I guess greatest teacher was a gentleman by the name of David Zima. Now, David Zima is a voiceover talent, an artist, and all, if not most, of your questions should be answered today in response to how do you get into the voiceover business. David has been in voiceover for over I don't know how many years. It's just been an extensive, extensive career. And I must say, I learned a lot. Even though at the time when David Zima was my instructor, I could not apply myself the way I wanted to because a whole lot of personal issues going on. But even in those circumstances, I learned from David. Number one, I learned that the voice of a business is a business. It is a, a serious business. We make serious money. There was a couple of times when I came late, and he, he really said, you know what, this is real. My time is valuable. And from that moment on, I, whenever I did go on auditions, I would make sure that I was on time. I would like to say his influence on me has been um, amazing. It's my pleasure once again to introduce to you David Zima, voiceover talent and artist and gentleman extraordinaire. Hello, Anthony. How are you, sir? I am good. It's good to hear from you. Uh, you sound good. I just wanted to thank you for having me on. Actually, I have a whole bunch of questions to sure. ask you. Go ahead. In the last email, you had sent me about Lionel Wilson. Before we yeah. get started, I just wanted you to tell me how much Lionel Wilson meant to you. Tell, tell us about him, um, Mr. Wilson. I, I think he's par probably partially responsible for why I got into the business. Uh, when I was a, a kid, there was a cartoon on uh, television on the Captain Kangaroo show called Tom Terrific. And uh, mm -hmm. Tom Terrific was uh, a, a little boy who was kind of a hero and a shapeshifter and uh, there were all these other characters, and uh, you know, as a kid, I just enjoyed the cartoon. And I, I, you know, one of the reasons I was interested in voiceovers was because of television and cartoons like that. And but also, of course, radio uh, got me into announcing and, and such. But uh, later on, when I, I came to New York City, I'm from originally from near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I came to New York City, and I'd studied announcing and I'd studied voiceovers, and then I wanted to do character work and. I was looking around for a teacher, and someone said, well, Lionel Wilson used to teach uh, character. At that time, he was in his mid-60s, and he wasn't as much actively teaching. He used to teach at a school, and but I found him because he was guest uh, teaching here and there. And I, when I saw his credits, I saw that, well, wait a minute. This is the man who did the voices on Tom Terrific, not just one voice, but every voice. So he did about four or five different characters every week in some of these cartoons. So I met with him, and he was very, uh, very gracious, very uh, nice man, and uh, you know I learned a lot. And actually, a couple years after that, we were both working on a pilot for a cartoon series called Inspector Cat, and I was Inspector Cat, and he was playing some of the other characters. So I actually got to work with him as well. So he meant a lot to me. And last night at my studio, I had found some clips of his work, and actually found uh, two of his friends who are in their early 80s, early to mid 80s, who came to the event and spoke about him and brought some rare recordings of, of him. Actually, Lionel wrote the book for a musical about being a voiceover performer. There was a demo of it for investors, and there were some songs that he was singing on it. He, he could sing in character, too. You see. <laughs> uh, this man was a Broadway performer. Uh, he was uh, you know, television and did commercials, and that's how he, I think, got into animation is he met some animators on TV you know, who were doing TV commercials and went on to do a lot of different cartoons. So, yes, he inspired me, and also I, I think back in Pittsburgh, uh, P Pittsburgh was a big media town back then, still is, and my younger brother and I were very interested in radio, and my father had a huge uh, German radio, Telefunken radio, and we would pull in AM stations from... Fort Wayne, Indiana, from Canada, from New York City. And New York City, I would hear people like Chuck Leonard, who uh, was a great uh, announcer. Um, I remember him. Yeah, right. Yeah, Chuck Leonard. Uh, he passed away a few years ago in his late 60s, I think he was. He was one of the top people who uh, I remember who really sounded like he was talking to one person. Really, that's what it's all about on radio. When I came to New York, I did meet Chuck Leonard and spoke with him several times. I met a lot of these people through the union, through AFTRA, through the Museum of Broadcasting at different events and such, and got to work with many of them. I, I wanted to do voiceovers probably from the time I was a kid before my voice changed. <laughs> 
And my younger brother is into uh, radio. He's a broadcaster, a music host. He's also done some work for some of the sports teams, for the Pirates and such, back there in Pittsburgh. So we're both very much into it. And, of course, I coach and teach people and help people to get into the business as well. How did you get into the, uh, the voice of what, what was your motivation? Uh, you know, what, what said to you, I want to do this? I was into all kinds of uh, media production. I learned photography. I learned audio and video when I was young. And, you know, we had Super 8 cameras and such. And so I was always working, you know, around media and doing things. And as when you do that, you're involved in productions and often a voiceover is needed. And it was since it was something I was interested in and wanted to do, I also uh, explored that. Sometimes you start out just doing what's called the scratch track for a, for a production. Sometimes I was doing um, educational slideshows, which needed a voice, and the people I was working with would say, well, we like your voice, why don't you do it? So, you know, I, I got more serious about it after that and studied. Of course, I had always studied in school voice and diction and speech. So when I came to New York, then I, I found uh, classes and became proficient and practiced. You have to practice a lot. And you do have to uh, then produce a demo once you have gained confidence. So that's how I did it, from studying and practice and finding out what you're good at. Now, let me ask you, David. Yeah. You've been in the industry uh, an awfully long time. And just looking over some things, how much has the industry changed? I mean, uh, in your uh, website, which I will give out to you guys, um, you said that years and years ago, as I remember, you had to go into a, a place to actually audition, but it was a studio or the like. And now a lot of it is done by email and computers. How much has the industry actually changed, David? Well, um, the more it changes, the more it stays the same, in a sense. There were uh, long distance, what I call long-distance voiceover jobs were available 20, 25 years ago, but not everyone knew about them. There were voiceover performers like myself who went after work like that. And some people had their own studio back then at home. Other people just made a deal with a local studio to get some decent rates because they were bringing business to the studio. So long-distance voiceover work has been around a long time. Some of that is the same. It's just it's more prolific now. I guess the prices of equipment has gone down in a sense, and everyone has a computer. It's like a television set. People have computers. But it's more to it than just turning on a computer and recording. I mean, you have to have a decent microphone, a good sound card. You have to have a quiet room or some soundproofing or both. So it has changed in the sense that uh, I guess there's more opportunity. There's still live auditions. I mean, I go to them all the time, and there's still times when we go to the producer's studio to do the voiceover. There, not every thing is done at a home studio, and not every audition is done at a home studio. Certainly a lot more. So I think there's more opportunity because voiceovers have always been very specific. They use different types of voices for different messages, whether it's a, right. a commercial right. or whether it's a corporate message or a training program or a video game. So they always need different kinds of voices. So it has changed. I, I think that there's more opportunity. It's not just the golden radio voice anymore. Uh, it never was. I mean, someone like Lionel Wilson was a character artist. He didn't right. have he didn't have the uh, the announcer voice. So actors were always in demand. Especially what Lionel did was also a lot of work for children. He, you know, besides the cartoons, he read a, he was a narrator. He read a lot of uh, children's books. Also wrote books and things. And, and you know, I think that's another thing that performers should be aware of too is to be diversified. I mean, I've always had mm -hmm. the media background. I had the ability to record myself twenty some years ago. Wow. And, yeah, and I do audio and video, and I've had a studio that long as well. So that's what I mean. This isn't a new thing. It's just more available. The producer now, sometimes they're actually not producers anymore. There's someone who, let's say, is producing a PowerPoint for a website, and uh, you know the person who's hiring him doesn't want to then have to hire a voiceover performer. So he's going to hire one person. Small businesses are always looking for one-stop shopping, I think. Right. Uh, so, yeah, because it's easier to just go to one person and you know, get all of your needs met for your production. So this person now who is maybe a web person or a PowerPoint person uh, now needs a voice. So he is the one who is seeking for a voice, and he may not know how to direct or he may not know how to record. So he's looking for someone with a home studio. He's looking for someone who can direct themselves. So a lot of this is uh, finding the right person who knows what their skill is, and that was always true. So that's what I mean by the more things change, the more they stay the same. You, have to, as a performer, have to know what your strengths are. And you find that by working with a coach. By It's not like you can just pick 
one from column A and one from column B, and I've heard so many demos where people just do that. They think they should have one of this and one of that and two of this and three of that, and it's like, no, you got to have what you're really good at, and you have to be the go-to gal or the go-to guy for that particular mm -hmm. sound. You know, So you've got that deep voice, and for you it might be more corporate stuff. For you it might be exactly. more announcing and more narration and the confident sound. And someone else who's got a different range, it might be the fun or the guy next door or the gal next door, you see. So I think knowing who you are is the start and then getting really good at that and seeing where you fit in. I mean, because you just can't be all things to all people, which is why people don't get cast every day because they're very specific many times. The, they might be able to do five or six or seven things, but still those are in a certain range and they're very specific. Marketing that is what the performer must do. I mean, in the seminar we were holding last night, we talked about mm -hmm. marketing as well. And people, one of the gentlemen there was saying how much he is sending out his demos uh, and web links to people via email, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you can't just post your demo on a website and expect the whole world to find you. You see, you've got to do more. I think any freelance field requires an awful lot of marketing effort. I mean, most people who have a nine-to-five job, they went on mm -hmm. one interview and then they have the job for two years, five years, or maybe for life. <laughs> people in, in a freelance business or in a performing arts have to go on job interviews every day or auditions or show their portfolio if they're an artist or a photographer. So you have to get really good at prospecting. You can't just put up a demo and, like I said, expect the world to be the path to your website or door. I mean, it was the same thing in the old days. People would send out demos and say, well, nobody called. Well, you can't just do it once, you know. There's so many people who try to get into this and then drop out. I mean, you can go on eBay and find all kinds of used <laughs> audio equipment and sound really things. And sure, because people have dropped out. But I think that's also a problem. People will buy all the window dressing. They'll buy like the microphone and the soundproofing and this and that. And then they don't have the skills. There was a story I was reading the other day, which I think is important about the, I think it was one of the, the coaches of the Green Bay Packers. I think it was uh, Vince Lombardi had been asked what he was going to do to turn the team around. And he said he was going to get brilliant on the basics, meaning being the best at all the basic skills so that nobody could stop the team. That's really one of the important things for people starting out is to really, well, first of all, know, as I said, who you are, what you can do, where you fit in. And then get really, really good at that. It's not going to be the, the fact that you have a fabulous microphone that's going to get you the job. You know, if, really? if, some, yeah, if somebody likes you and you've done the recording at home and the quality isn't that good, they may send you to a studio or you can rent a local studio. So, you, you know, running out and buying the microphone isn't necessarily the first thing. But, yeah, it is something in order to be competitive that you do have to have. I mean, if you you think about it, in a lot of industries, you can you can rent before you can buy. So really, yeah, there are, there are studios everywhere. Well, recently we were doing some political ads. One of my students had booked off of her demo, and we we got this through Voice123.com. A lot of my students are on there, but someone had heard her demo and asked her to do a series of political ads and. We did like about a dozen of them, and then they called up and said, oh, we've added, we've changed some of the names or some of the politicians and this and that. And, uh, and then I realized that this uh, student of mine was in Memphis. So I was like, oh, well, geez, they must have recording studios in Memphis. So <laughs> I went on to uh, Voice 123, and I found uh, a radio station, a member who was at a radio station, and we connected the producer. It was like a whole... I guess, uh, people around the country here who were producing this. There was somebody in Philadelphia, somebody in Los Angeles, and then the talent was in Memphis, and I was in New York coordinating this. Anyway, I found the studio for her to go to in Memphis, and they recorded her there, and then when she came back to New York, we had more recording to do. You can find a studio, is my point, in, in many, many areas, and, or even someone's home studio if they're willing to rent it, if, if they're in your area. Because I've been helping people set theirs up, too, and some people will try to do it in a closet or they'll throw up the, you know, well, I've got some blankets and I'll throw that up. And, and, you know, sometimes they just end up muffling their voice rather than cutting out background noise. So there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. So I think that uh, helps, it makes it in a way more, it's more competitive. It's harder to get in maybe than it was 20 years mm -hmm. ago. So it's changed that way because now the talent is responsible for learning how to do recording and soundproofing and editing sometimes. But you can also, like I said, you can partner with somebody. I've recorded many, many of my students have rented my studio, and I've recorded them and edited the tracks for them. I have some students who are just not 
interested or maybe it's not their strength, the recording part. They maybe got a set up at, uh, to do the auditioning at home, but it's not the quality enough to send out to the producer. So they rent my studio. 